On this edition of Food for Life, Chris Keyes and Marcel Dion continue their conversation on the pastoral plan. Any pastor that has a heart for the church, that claims to be um, in union with the Pope, right, and magisterial and all that stuff, should, should be listening to these words and praying, taking into that consideration, praying about, Lord, what does that mean for me? When many of us think of the word holiness, we think, wow, that's out of the realm of possibilities for me. Nevertheless, holiness is a key strategy for the renewal of the church. And we're really happy to have Marcel Dion uh, back with us today to talk about actually John Paul II's vision um, for how this new springtime, how we're going to kind of come into this new springtime, this new period of renewal in the church. And, and I know that holiness is at, is at the heart of it. So maybe you could share that with us, Marcel. Yes, Chris, thank you. So the context is this apostolic letter, Novo Millennio in Eunte, right? We're, in, we're beginning the new, this new millennium. He puts it in that context, not just this next decade or this next centenary, but this next millennium, all right? And he's talking about what, what is the Spirit saying to the church? What are we hearing from the Holy Spirit coming out of this, this year of grace, the great jubilee, this river of grace has been flowing. What's the Spirit been saying to the church? And he says, as we begin this new millennium, our hearts ring out with the words of Christ put out into the deep. Duke in altum. Put out into the deep. Which is drawn from the account in Luke's Gospel, chapter 5. Christ uh, has been preaching, teaching, and he uh, takes one, uh, Peter's boat and goes out into the water so he can have better access. And, you know, he's swarmed by the crowd. So he's teaching from the boat. And when he completes that teaching, he says to Peter, now, let's put out into deep waters. And he says, well, Master, we've been toiling all night, fishing all night, which they had been. They got nothing, nothing, not a thing, not a guppy, right? They have nothing to show for an entire night's fishing. But Peter says, but at your word, we will do so. So John Paul makes the point that this is an obedience of faith. It's an active faith in the words of Christ. So they put out into deep waters. They let down their nets for a catch. And they take in this huge haul. So much so that they have to call out a second boat. And both are filled to the point where the, the boats they fear are, will sink. Okay, so you see the fruitfulness of obedience, of an act of faith to the words of Christ. And this is the scripture that John Paul uses basically as the foundation for this apostolic letter. So he's calling the entire church to put out into the deep. And remember, we talked about the fact that he says the church now enters a new stage of its history, of its journey. So part of this new stage, this new journey, this new phase is putting out into the deep. So we'll talk a bit about what that means. And then he outlines the seven pastoral priorities, the first one being holiness. And he says some remarkable things about holiness. He says, I have no hesitation, first of all, I have no hesitation in stating that all pastoral initiatives, all pastoral initiatives must be set in relation to holiness. Now that's a statement that's loaded with implications. Here's a holy father, the Holy Father, one of the greatest popes of, our, of the church's history, who had a great pastoral understanding. He, he was brilliant intellectual, but he wasn't just an intellectual. He was a mystic. We know that from those who, who knew him, right? A deep, lived a deep mystical life. But he was also a phenomenally good pastor, a fruitful pastor. And he says, I have no hesitation that all pastoral initiatives. So that's a word to any pastor that's hearing this, right? If we're any pastor that has a heart for the church, that claims to be um, in union with the Pope, right? And magisterial and all that stuff should, should be listening to these words and praying, taking into consideration, praying about, Lord, what does that mean for me? That all of my pastoral initiatives must be set in relation to holiness. He says, stressing holiness remains more than ever an urgent pastoral task. So 
again, we, we need to ponder these words, right? Because they're, they're, the implications are immense. Now, and then he goes on to say that holiness, what he means by holiness, he says holiness needs to be understood primarily in the sense of belonging to the one who himself is holy, the thrice holy God. So holiness is not primarily about activity. It's not primarily about being religious or spiritual. It's not, primar it's not primarily about ministry, you know, having a lot of ministry, keeping busy, doing the stuff. It's not primarily about evangelization. Again, this is from the Pope, the evangelist Pope, mm -hmm. right, who has per perennially reissued that call to the new evangelization, to the whole church. And yet he says, holiness primarily means belonging to God, mm -hmm. belonging to Jesus. So when we hear that, I'm called to holiness, we should be hearing, I'm called to the embrace, to be embraced by God, to this deep, intimate, transforming union with God. That's what it's about. It's not about measuring up through my activity, right? It's not about the law. It's not producing works, right? We're not saved by works, but by grace, right? By faith, you've been saved, right? And so that, that's the whole foundation of the priorities that come, and all the priorities are the foundation for all pastoral initiatives. So he says that um, holiness is itself, first of all, a gift. It's a gift of God to us by virtue of his love and his mercy, right? It's a gift we receive at baptism. Baptism, he says, is a true entry into the holiness of God. Therefore, he says, it doesn't make sense for us, for any baptized. When we say, do you, you, know, do you want to be baptized? Essentially, what the church is saying is, do you want to become holy? That's, that's right out of the document. So, he says, this gift that we receive at baptism must in turn become a task which must shape the whole of Christian life. Mm -hmm. So again, there's the paradox in the Christian life, right? We're saved by grace, but St. Paul says, right, work out your salvation in fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to desire and to do this work, right? There's a paradox there, right? It's all about God, but we have to be fully engaged. We have to choose it. And Catechism tells us it's in that that our true dignity lies, right? Early on, I think it's 25, 6, or 7 of the Catechism, it says, right, our, our dignity lies in that we're called to communion with God, tying it in with holiness, right? Communion with God is only possible if we are holy, but we're not holy by nature. We have to be made holy by grace. So he says this gift of holiness... Uh, which we receive at baptism, must in turn then become a task which shapes our whole Christian life. And then he quotes 1 Thessalon uh, Thessalonians 4.3. This is the will of God, yeah. our sanctification. So for those who have that reflex, which I understand, both we've talked about this, mm -hmm. right? That part of us that just says, oh man, that's out of my reach, that's out of my league. You know, and we want to say to others, and even to God, you don't know me, right? You don't know how much I struggle and how much I fail and how self-centered I am, right? How I'm yeah. so preoccupied with myself. This holiness thing, it's, it's not for me. As though God doesn't know what he's doing, right? But clearly, the scripture, he, and he chooses a very simple scripture, right? This is the will of God, our sanctification. Therefore, if it's the will of God, clearly it's possible. But it can only be made possible by the grace of God, yeah. Yeah. right? Only the grace of God can keep us and accomplish in us the will of God fully, right? So he says this duty, this privileged duty of sanctification, of holiness, right, is something that is for everybody. It's not, it's not for, and here again he quotes a document of Vatican II that says this, uh, Lumen Gentium 40. All Christian faithful of whatever state or rank are called to the fullness of the Christian life and the perfection of charity. So there you have Vatican II's 
expression or definition, if we will, of holiness. Yeah. Holiness is the fullness of the Christian life and the perfection mm -hmm. of charity. So that, that, the journey is about that, living the fullness of the life that we're called to more and more, this life of the Trinity, right, in Christ, the life of the Holy Spirit, more and more and more, which is to perfect charity in us so that, by the grace of God, we can fulfill the two great commandments, to love God with our whole heart, our whole mind and soul and strength, right, not just a little bit, not just on Sundays, not just even mostly loving God, mm -hmm. not loving God with the majority of my mind and heart and emotion and time and finances, but with everything, mm -hmm. right? Holding nothing back. Mm -hmm. That's the call. That's the challenge. And that's what God wants to do in us and accomplish in us. So then he says, therefore, holiness must become the foundation of all pastoral planning. So, as those of us who are involved in parish ministry, for example, or any kind of ministry, that would be something, it would be a criteria for discernment and assessing. How are we doing? Is all of our pastoral work, is the foundation for it holiness, this call to holiness? If it's not, are there some adjustments that we might want to make? Well, I mean, what's, what's great about yes. saying that is that, that it, it's going to, it forces all of us to say, Okay, we better understand what it is then. Yes. You know, because it's like there's, there's like this whole phase where we have to say, okay, holiness has to color everything we do pastorally. Yes. So we better understand yes. what it means. The other thing that strikes me too is, you know, when you're saying, quoting from Lumen Gentium, where it says, you know, the fullness of the Christian life, it's kind of, for me, it's counterintuitive. It's not what I normally think of when I think holiness. When I think of holiness, I think of, Less. <laughs> if I'm going on the right. path to holiness, it the cost. means less. It doesn't mean full. It actually means empty. You know. So, but John Paul is almost echoing, or the the, the, the Vatican Fathers are echoing those words of John 10:10. 10, 10, you know, I've come so that you may have life abundantly. So that's yes. that's kind of what really sticks out when you when uh -huh. you read that. It's it's not about less. It's about it's about more. Anyway, continue. I agree, Chris, and I think you're not the only one to, to have that reaction mm -hmm. because we have, let's face it, m not even just centuries. We have for thousands of years, most lay people have thought in those terms. Yeah. Right? And it's a heresy, right? It's from the pit of hell. And to the degree that we have those ways of thinking, our minds need to be renewed, yeah. right? Yeah. Romans 12, 1, right? Be renewed, right? Uh, don't be conformed to the spirit of this age and the mindset of this age, right? But, but, by, but be renewed by the renewal of your mind, yeah. right? So those attitudes need to die. We need to, in fact, what we need to do is by the grace of God and, and with the illumination of the Holy Spirit, ask the grace, the, the Holy Spirit, to show us those areas of our minds and hearts where we're not, we don't have the mind of Christ. We don't mm -hmm. have the mind of the church and we need to confess them and repent of them and renounce that. That's part of the work. That's part of the duty. Then he goes on to say, it's, it would be a contradiction for the baptized to settle for a life of mediocrity marked by shallow religiosity and a minimalistic ethic. How many of us have to have maybe something to bring to confession? Right? Do I have to examine our, do I have a minimalistic ethic? Mm. Am I content with what's enough? Yeah. Not everything, yeah. right? The radi and he says it's to set before us the radical nature of the Sermon on the Mount, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Yeah. That's one of those hard sayings of Jesus, right? Yeah. How often do we dance around that one or we just flip to the next page, right? Well, let's, let's talk a bit about about the Christian and, and the Catholic understanding of perfection. Like sometimes we can have, you know, in our minds, we have this, uh, we have a stereotype of perfection. And I think um, having an understanding of what that looks like or knowing that there's a, a version that applies to me might help us. I don't know if, if John Paul II says anything specific about that, but you know, you hear the word perfect and perfection and it's like, you know, we get all stiff and go, oh, my goodness gracious. Any, what are your thoughts on that? Well, you know, there's... A vision for perfection. Yes, yeah. Well, p part of the challenge, there's a, a unique challenge here for lay people because 
for the most part, the models of perfection that we have set before us are the saints. Mm -hmm. And that's wonderful. That's great, right? But uh, for many of us, again, we can, we can disconnect with that because I'm not living in a religious community. I don't have that kind of rule of life. I don't have that kind of support, right? Yeah. And, and so one of the challenges of the church in our age is for lay men and women to wrestle with the question of what is this going to look like in my life? What is this going to look like? Recently, I had someone tell me, uh, share a beautiful thing about that, that the evangelical vows, right, of chastity, obedience, and poverty, that in some respects, right, lay men and women, and especially uh, husbands and wives that are raising families and large Catholic families have a phenomenal opportunity to, to live out those vows, right? Clearly, there, there's a high requirement to live purity and chastity within marriage. Yes. Okay, so the fact that they have the blessing of the nuptial exchange does not uh, lessen the obligation they have to celebrate and to receive that gift in purity mm -hmm. and holiness right and so that's so that will look different but it, but the essence of it has to be the same a purity of heart a purity of vision a self-giving not a, a, a participation in the nuptial embrace just basically to gratify my flesh and to you know to get what i want right so so there's an opportunity so there's an opportunity for holiness right am i to examine our lives. In terms of poverty, many, many Catholic families are making huge temporal sacrifices because they want the mother to remain at home. Right. Many of them are homeschooling, right? And so the, the husband goes out to work and is laying down his life for his wife and for his children, and they're living a standard of life which is far below what many would desire Right? They're, they're living a kind of frugality and poverty for the sake of the love of, of their devotion to their vocation. Right? And so you're, you're looking again at that's an evangelical vow that's not lived out being, you know, uh, oh, I don't own anything. Right. You know, which, you know, there, there's room, obviously. It, it's intended to be a means of grace and a means of holiness for those in religious life. But sadly we've seen right in the, some of the the scandal in the church and the, the need for purification of the churches we see uh, many religious living more affluent lives than lay people right they don't own anything but their communities are very wealthy they own property and there's all kinds you know and so again it's not the call to holiness isn't about um, this state or that state right it's about this belonging to the one who is holy right? It's called about living the fullness of the Christian life, which points to uh, also uh, living a life of virtue, mm -hmm. right, in a heroic sense, right? So the saints, that's one, of the, they're, they're not just virtuous, but they have a high degree of virtue that they, they live constantly. And so, again, uh, families, you know, parents raising children, right, the need for patience and wisdom and prudence and discipline and tough love all those things mm -hmm. there's an opportunity right to exercise virtue in a very constant way right yeah. and in terms of obedience again like if if the husband for example is going to be true to his wife well he can't just decide what he wants to do whenever he wants to mm -hmm. do it mm -hmm. you know the boys call and say well let's go out and do such and such you know well, there, there's an obligation, right, to submit many decisions right. to the greater good, right, of the family. And subsequently, like the, the kids and the, and the wife as well has, has that opportunity. So holiness, you know, I mean, those are just some ideas. No, but basically, really we, really we, we need to wrestle with that. What's yeah. it going to look like? And, yeah. and to know that it's not going to look the same. Yeah. And I think that, that's one of the things that has discouraged lay people from responding to this call to holiness because they read the accounts of the saints and you know they say oh, I can't live that yeah. I can't live that I've got kids I've got to go to work yeah. you know I have the obligations and the other thing is that many of the accounts of the lives of the saints are written by people who themselves may not be perfected in charity and so 
you know, you get all the stuff from the saints that's really impressive and yeah. really different. What I like about John Paul when he's doing all of this is at the beginning, he gives us a very simple metaphor. He says, go deep. Yes. And everyone gets that. Yeah. I talk to people on, you know, all kinds of people at their faith. I like to talk to people at their faith on a continuum from just starting out to fast tracking towards, you know, whatever. Yeah. Everyone gets the idea that I know I need to go deeper. Right. There's some aspects of my life that are superficial. So there's a, such a simple definition. John Paul also tells us it's a gift. Yes. So Marcel, I wonder if you could lead, lead us in a prayer today for those folks that, that really, they want to go deeper. Mm -hmm. They don't know what to make out of this whole holiness word, but they know they need to go deeper. Mm -hmm. And man, would they like the gift to get there. So could, right. you, sure. could you lead us in a prayer today? Okay, let's pray. So I invite you uh, folks just to pray along with me. Because I make this prayer for myself as well. Mm -hmm. You need to know that and for Chris and I. Lord Jesus, Father, Father, loving Father, I begin by confessing that, Lord, I have really struggled with this call to holiness. And there are parts of me in my mind and my heart, Lord, parts of unbelief. I have had difficulty believing that this call could be for me. But Lord, your revelation is clear in scripture and through the voice of the church, especially our beloved and blessed John Paul. And so Lord, I confess that my own lack of faith, my own lack of conversion, my own unbelief, has had a role to play in not responding to this call. So I make that confession, Lord, I repent of it. I renounce this, I lay it at the foot of the cross. And I pray, Lord, that you forgive me and that you renew my mind, Lord. Put in me a new song, a song of faith and courage and confidence that because this is your will, my sanctification, your grace is there for me, Lord, to make it possible, to make it possible. Lord, I receive this gift. Once again, Lord, I accept the unmerited grace of my baptism, my sonship and daughterhood in Christ. And I pray, Lord, that you fan into a flame this gift, this holiness that is imparted to me, granted to me by your grace, by your merits, and that you give me the courage and the commitment to embark upon this journey, to accept this privileged duty, to accept this task, to order my whole life according to this call to holiness, and that you increase my desire for you, Lord, to know you more and more, the thrice holy God, that our union might be so deepened that your grace would transform me completely and utterly to your greater honor and glory and to the building up of the kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you, Lord. Amen. This has been the third segment of Chris Keyes and Marcel Dion's conversation on The Pastoral Plan. For an audio CD or video DVD of this complete teaching, we invite you to write to us. Our address is Food for Life, Box 1107, Station F, Toronto, Ontario, M4Y2T8. When you write, ask for an audio CD or video DVD of the teaching by Chris Keys and Marcel Dion on The Pastoral Plan. On the next edition of Food for Life, Chris Keyes and Marcel Dion continue their conversation on the pastoral plan. It may be really dynamic, spiritual, you know, anointed fruit of vibrating to the Spirit's touch and being wholly possessed by the Divine Beloved, right? But it's not the cause. Ministry will not cause me to become holy. We would like to extend a sincere note of thanks to you, our viewers, who have so faithfully supported Food for Life through these many years through your 
prayers, through your financial gifts to the ministry. Today I want to read a few comments from viewers that we've received, and I think they'll bless you, and especially those of you who invest in this ministry through your prayerful and financial support, you'll see that what you do is really making a difference. The first viewer writes and says, I'm a Protestant, but I enjoy your comments on Food for Life. Your sincerity makes me believe that someday soon we may truly be one. Another viewer writes and said, says, You have been such a blessing to me. Terrific Bible teaching, a beautiful balance of the Word, the heart and the mystery of God. You've given me great hope for spiritual renewal in the church and a mature, spirit-filled lay ministry. Another viewer writes and says, I want to thank you for your Food for Life program. You inspire me to be a stronger Christian and more devout Catholic. You help me in many ways, opening my mind and heart to a fuller personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And one final comment I'd like to read to you comes from a viewer who writes, Thank you for your Catholic television program. You represent the faith in such a way that proclaims the good news and love of God and salvation available in Jesus and the power to live the Christian and Catholic life through the power of the Holy Spirit. I thank these viewers for taking the time to write. And again, I thank you for the support that you lend to this ministry. You know, many people are surprised or they see Food for Life and they think, oh, they get some lump sum of funding and they're taken care of. That's not the case. We have no one organization or source from where our, our funding comes from, but it's through people like you. People like you make the difference and allow us to stay on the air and to proclaim the good news. If you feel that Food for Life's been a blessing to you, perhaps you could prayerfully consider a one-time gift or even consider becoming a monthly partner with us. We also have many convenient ways to give. We have pre-authorized donation plans. I can send you that information. And it can make giving very, very convenient and very easy. If Food for Life's been a blessing to you, if you see that the impact that it's making on people's lives is important, please write to us at Food for Life. We'd like to hear from you. For an audio CD or video DVD of today's ministry, we invite you to write to us. When you write, mention the program number 1414 and today's topic, Marcel Dion on The Pastoral Plan. Food for Life is a nonprofit Catholic charity funded only by donations from viewers. To help us continue this Catholic television ministry, please send your tax deductible donation to Food for Life. Box 1107, Station F, Toronto, Ontario, M4Y2T8. If every viewer gave a loony or a toonie each week, all expenses would be met. If you have never donated before, we ask that you make your check payable to Food for Life, and our address is Food for Life, Box 1107, Station F, Toronto, Ontario, m 4 y to T8. You may now make your donation online. Just go to our website at www.foodforlifetvministry.org and follow the link. Thanks to your faithful prayers and tax-deductible financial support, Food for Life is the longest-running Catholic television program in Canada. On the next edition of Food for Life, Chris Keyes and Marcel Dion continue their conversation on the pastoral plan. It may be really dynamic, spiritual, you know, anointed fruit of vibrating to the Spirit's touch and being wholly possessed by the Divine Beloved, right? But it's not the cause. Ministry will not cause me to become holy. This has been the third segment of Chris Keyes and Marcel Dion's conversation on The Pastoral Plan. For an audio CD or video DVD of this complete teaching, we invite you to write to us. Our address is Food for Life, Box 1107, Station F, Toronto, Ontario, M4Y2T8.